on a beautiful, if not hot and muggy, summer, uh, <laughs> summer morning. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our, our new friend, uh, Dr. Sidney DeMello from Notre Dame University, University of Notre Dame, I guess it's, anyway, Fighting Irish. Uh, and Dr. DeMello is, uh, he currently holds a joint appointment in computer science and psychology. <laughs> And the reason that we, uh, we invited Dr. DeMello to join us is because uh, one of the things COIL and Penn State have identified as, as uh, a, a big picture issue that we need to be addressing is personalized learning. We believe that it's inevitable that learning will soon leave the group-based approach and people will be able to make appropriate individualized progress. Uh, within personalized learning, there's a, there's a lot of room there. But Dr. DeMello's focus is really looking at affect sensing. So when I read about Dr. DeMello's work where, imagine a system uh, that people could be learning through that could understand the emotional states and the reactions that, uh, that a learner is going through and could adapt based on that. So uh, he's doing pioneering work in those fields and others. He's doing work in discourse processing, artificial intelligence, human computer interaction, um, models of human cognition. He is, uh, he is a sort of a generalist within this niche. And his breadth of background and his experiences uh, caused us to reach out to him. And uh, he said, sure, I'll come by. On my way, I'm going to Penn. On, he'll be at, at Penn tomorrow, and then he's going up to uh, Canada. And he decided to work us in. So I offer my sincere thanks to Dr. DeMello for building us into his schedule. And with that, I'll turn the program over to its rightful owner. Oh, great. Thanks uh, Thanks for that introduction, and thanks for having me over. It's my first time, and it's been uh, wonderful so far. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, I have a, a, a lot of uh, slides. Um, we'll keep this informal um, in the spirit of the conversation, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, there is absolutely no need for me to uh, go through the whole slide deck, um, and I'll be doing an, another informal talk this afternoon so we could continue there. Okay. Uh, so uh, what our lab is, is really interested in and what we're really interested in studying is um, best illustrated. Uh, let me actually first start by thanking uh, our lab at Notre Dame uh, and our, our collaborators um, you know, who do a, a, a lot of this work. Um, I like to say they're the, the brains of operation and just the looks, um, but, uh, and our funders, obviously. Um, so um, I, I like to... You know, think about the phenomena that we're interested in. Um, here's a, a video, for example, of somebody um, in, a, in a reading uh, context, uh, reading uh, difficult texts on research methods. And initially, um, you know, she's uh, trying hard and, and things are going well. Um, you know, and, 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 and a bit later, uh, the same person, actually not that much later, just a, a little bit later, you can, you can see a, hopefully see a change in, in her state. Um, and uh, uh, maybe that's better for learning, um, you know. Um, ironically, this is during a motivational intervention. Um, so uh, what we're really interested in is the phenomenology of, of thought and feeling during learning. So, so how do a certain types of thoughts arise, and how do emotions arise, and how do they influence learning? And that's what we're trying to understand first, and then developing technologies around it. So we have, um, I would say, three core goals that drive our work. Um, so at the heart, we have psychologists, and we, ha we have a, a, a need to understand basic research on mental states as they arise during learning. Um, and we do this in the context of complex learning tasks and problem solving with technology. Um, we are, have a, a strong theoretical bent towards modeling. So we, uh, we, we, we always like to model everything. So we want to model these states uh, in terms of different sensors and signals. And we use machine learning uh, to bring it all together. And finally, uh, to satisfy our engineering bones, we like to use the, the models to do something, uh, put it back into the world. So we like to close the loop by developing learning technologies um, that coordinate what, what people think and feel uh, to building on a large, maybe 30 years of research on what they know and do. So, so this is sort of our big vision. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is our work on two domains. Um, I'll start with affect and learning. Uh, and there are three subsections, some basic, basic ideas on affect and learning, how we sense affect, 
Um, and how we uh, develop what we call affect OS cyber learning systems that are sensing your state and adapting accordingly. Uh, over the last couple of years, maybe four years, we've shifted our focus a bit to attentional state during learning. So specifically attentional lapses. So um, uh, if, if time permitting, I'll talk to you about a very specific type of attentional state that is the quintessential sign of, of waning and that's mind wandering. Um, and we'll talk about how you can pick it up in real time. Uh, it poses a unique set of challenges compared to affect because it's not that visible in the face. Um, and, and the parallel is attentional aware systems. So as you're reading or doing some task, it's tracking whether you're attending to the task or if you're zoned out uh, entirely. And later on, um, I'll talk to you about some other projects. This is in the afternoon um, on um, very briefly uh, how we can automatically collect and analyze classroom discourse. So uh, just using simple microphones. Um, a side project uh, on looking at non-intellective non factors that predict achievement. Um, and this is things like, this relates to the affective work, like the ability to tolerate intense boredom or intense frustration, and so on and so forth. And some more pie in the sky things we're doing now, which is uh, more attention of groups. Um, how do we coordinate eye gaze of like 30 people at a time? Um, and affective co-regulation, how people regulate emotions. Um, so that's sort of the agenda. Uh, and as I said, I'll just try to get through as much as I can. Uh, but feel free to uh, stop in at any time. So one thing to note when we think about affect and learning is affect plays, plays across multiple time scales. So you can start by thinking about affective traits like hostility. A hostile person is more likely to, to be angry, but maybe not more likely to experience other negative emotions like sad. So that's the whole trait level work. Then there's work and baseline moods, uh, things like I'm feeling good right now, generalized anxiety, positive, negative, over longer time scales. Um, and there's a different, and, and then there's a different set of theories that actually align with these different levels. Um, what we are mostly interested in are uh, affective states, which, 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 which take on the forefront of consciousness. And there are things like, they also play across different time scales, bored, engaged, anxious. We're talking about minutes here, maybe tens of minutes. Um, the uh, ones that are getting into a few seconds, tens of seconds, uh, confused, frustrated, momentary episodes of happiness. And then you have the real quick ones, delight and surprise. You know, it's, it's, it's weird to sustain a state of delight for long periods of time, right? And, and the, theoretical, the, the theories that we really look here are theories of appraisal, attributions, impasses, cognitive disequilibrium. These are theories that tell you, as you're interpreting the world, how you're actually uh, appraising and making sense of the world and how you detect discrepancies that, that, that essentially trigger, um, that, that, that tell you something is wrong with the world and it, it brings about um, action and how we can leverage that relationship. So let me just say that um, almost everything uh, that we know about emotions when we started this work is on basic emotions. You know, happiness, sadness, uh, disgust, fear, surprise, and um, I should know this, and one more. Uh, the six basic emotions, um, and this is this is work coming from Darwin in the 60s and Ekman and everybody, and it's good stuff. Um, they show that it's you know it occurs across cultures and primates and children and whatever. Um, so there's a there's a lot of work on emotion and basic emotions. It turns out though, in a one-on-one -on -one learning session, why would you really be afraid or disgusted or, or fearful? You can always think about isolated incidents. So when we started doing this work 10 years ago, we were noticing that we're not finding these emotions in the context that we care about. Um, so we, this is a meta-analysis done of studies. Um, I want to say it's a selective meta-analysis because we didn't identify every single study. But here's generally the idea. There are 24 studies here, about 2,000 learners, a lot of interaction. Uh, some in the lab, some in the classroom, tons of learning environments, and many methods to track emotion. There's good variability. The distinctive factor in these studies is emotion is tracked at very fine-grained levels, sometimes every 15 seconds. Uh, so between 15 seconds to about two minutes. So you're getting a really um, fine-grained lens. And these are the generally the findings. Um, uh, there's some state of engagement, whether it's an emotion, an affect, that's total debate. It's some composite. Uh, that's, that's always there. In addition to that, um, what you always see in every study, in every environment, at a large volumes, is confusion and boredom. Um, what you see frequently, when it, when, they, when, they, when it does occur, it occurs quite a bit, but it's not very consistent, is frustration, anxiety, happiness, and curiosity. So the affordances of the learning environment really dictate a lot of these. So a lot of intelligent tutoring systems, they do not want you to get stuck. You can always bail out. You can get hints. That's not an environment that creates a lot of frustration. Um, and what you don't see 
is anger, contempt, disgust, fear, sadness, surprise. A lot of the basic emotions. Let me emphasize, this is in short, short focused, medium to low stakes learning environments with a computer, half of them in the lab. You know, you guys, anybody who's done a dissertation knows you get the whole range there. Rage and fear and disgust and all of these different time scales, right? So I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one focus interaction. Um, we looked into building a model that talks about how these emotions may arise um, in this context. And uh, you're sort of, and this is one model, we're constantly refining it. Um, the idea is you start in a state, um, and I should say this, this builds off on um, uh, George Mandler's work on uh, interruption discrepancy um, back in the 70s. Um, you, you start in a state of sort of equilibrium, things are going well, you're doing your stuff, whatever, um, it's okay, until you hit an impasse. Uh, and that triggers the state of confusion. Along the way, you may experience surprise, but, but typically confusion. We believe that this is, provides a unique opportunity, and you can, you can problem solve. If you have AIDS, uh, you can actually get back, resolve your impasse, and you can get back into this cycle. Occasionally, you fail at impasse resolution, and you get stuck, and you can get frustrated. This can loop back, you make a little progress, you're confused again, and, and on and on. Um, Persistent failure leads to, um, you basically tend to give up and you get disengaged. And then if you're in one of our studies where you're locked up and you can't leave, that turns back into frustration because it's, it's, it's a forced effort, right? You're making me... Um, so this is kind of one a model we've been playing with to talk about how the, the emotions themselves and the dynamics and the events that, uh, the events that trigger them. So us and others have... Um, have tested this in various ways. I'll just tell you one recent study um, on how we tested this. Uh, so these are some of the domains in which this work has been done. Um, and you know there are many, most of them are with some computer agent, sometimes they're text heavy, sometimes we've even looked at uh, emotions with human tutoring. Um, so uh, here's one. Um, my student was very interested in emotions when people learn their first computer programming experience. And, and one of the first courses I taught was computer programming for psychologists. Uh, which, was, which was kind of cool, um, and, I, and I kind of learned a lot. So here's what we did. Uh, we have got novices. They've not done nothing. They've never programmed anything. And we developed this very simple Python environment. It gives them some lessons. They can play with some code. And we're talking really simple things. Um, then they can run their code. They can get a hint. Every time they get a hint, they lose a point. Um, and they do practice for about 25 minutes, and then the hints are gone, the explanations are gone, and they've got a really difficult problem where they've got to spend about 10 minutes on it. Uh, and nobody can actually solve that one. Um, so um, when, we, when they're going through these sessions, uh, they have no idea we're doing anything with emotion, nothing at all. We record their face, we record their computer screen, and we use uh, one protocol in this case to track emotions. It's also a really tricky way to get people to code their own data. So if anybody has done data coding, um, you basically present them videos of the session and videos of their face, and these cue memories immediately. And essentially, you just ask them at pre-specified points, to tell us what the emotions are. You can look at him really quick in a very small, tight window. You'll notice the furrowed brow shortly. There's a little frustrated brow. He's looking. He's got some information. He's resolved it, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, while this is happening, so this is just one example. And uh, this is, again, the distribution you get in this context. This is about 100 people. Um, so some, some engagement, quite a bit of confusion, frustration, boredom, curiosity, neutral. Those other seven are all your basic emotions, and I think contempt. Um, so um, we then say, okay, we can see how people are modeling and going through these emotions. Let's actually uh, see what else we can do. So we create these time series. So this says, okay, these are your emotions. And we look at the game logs. What actually, sorry, the, the tutor logs. What actually happened? You gave a hint, you gave an explanation, you asked for something. Uh, you got it right, you got it wrong, you compiled your code. And sometimes we actually build models. Here's a hidden Markov model. But other times we just look at very simple, how do you go from one state to the other after correcting for chance? Um, so it's like a poor man's um, lag sequential analysis uh, kind of technique. And here's, a, here's an example of one of the models. Um, so just to illustrate, um, you clearly see the central activity in this context is obviously coding, because they do a lot of coding. Um, and then you can see this, this very passive set of things. I'm reading, I'm neutral, cool, I'm curious, okay, I'm engaged, whatever, I'm coding some more. So that's, the, that's just the basic channel. Uh, the world really comes alive when things go wrong. So I, I, it, this ran, my program ran successfully, it compiled, but actually I got an error when I submitted it. What? Oh, I'm frustrated. Okay, what should I do? Let me get a hint. Or I'm confused, and so on and so forth. 
Um, the reason you don't see direct connections between emotions in this diagram is because those links are removed because the emotions occurring are measured every 15 seconds, but these other events occur all the time. So this is just one example illustrating how we sort of piece together um, these models and these theories. Um, so let me just move on. Um, so a core part of this work is this understanding of confusion as being the state um, that, that is essentially this quintessential mechanism for deep learning. Because if you think about it, why would you learn something deeply? Or, and what is deep learning adjusting a conceptual model if there's nothing to adjust? We need a reason to do this. Um, so we took this idea to develop a way to induce what we call productive confusion. Um, so it works like this. This is in the context of critical thinking of scientific research methods. So here you have these two agents, um, and they're having a conversation on a case study from the media. In this case, there's a diet pill that claims to work miracles. It's the usual media nonsense. Um, but it has critical flaws. They have a control group, but it's a bad control group. So there are very subtle uh, complications. Um, they have a conversation, and, and I'm the human, and I'm typing in, they're chatting, and so on and so forth. So the way it works is there's a case study, they all read it, and they talk a bit about it to make sure they understand it. Then um, over trials, they, they, these two agents are having a discussion. What do you think about the control group? Oh, I like the control group. Yeah, me too. OK, uh, do you think they had enough of, um, you think it was a strict enough control? I thought it was strict enough. No, I did not think it was strict enough. Let me ask Sydney. And then he asks the human. And then it's like, what? Uh, let me, so let me make a decision. And through this, you get them a bit confused. We sometimes verify that they got confused. And at that moment, you give them a text to read. And this is the text. It's a very general text. It's not about this problem or anything. It's just a text on control groups. Um, and the idea is, if you're primed to think about this in the state of disequilibrium, you will read it deeper to resolve your impasse. Uh, at least that's the theory. And then, obviously, to please the IRB, we have to give, all, you know, give it all away uh, at the end. Um, so here's some results. Um, so this, we've done about seven experiments. This is, I think, one experiment. Um, so what we have here is um, afterwards, they take a far transfer test. And these problems are difficult. So you take all of these research methods concepts, they put them in a completely different uh, domain, um, and they've got to diagnose flaws. Um, and here is whether the, you're not guaranteed to be confused by this manipulation. Um, a lot of people just don't care, or they don't even get it. Or they, or they don't want to admit that they're confused. So we divide it into cases where people are not confused or where they were confused. And there's, obvious, there's a control condition where there's no disagreement. So here are the results. Uh, this is not a significant difference. So basically, when you're not confused by the manipulation, there's no real difference uh, between the control group that gets no disagreement and the uh, intervention group. But we get a really a nice effect uh, in the cases when you are confused. Um, and our interpretation here is that essentially, this is giving them a reason to read the text a bit deeper and understanding it, understand it more conceptually. Um, so um, let me um, so uh, let me move on to um, so yeah yeah. Where you've created confusion in one way, but then you've given some other content and it got cemented down because of the confusion that transferred somehow or another. Yeah, uh, the, the only, well, I would say this though, it's a, it's a far transfer test, but it's not a delayed test. It would have been really nicer if we had got them a week later. Uh, but yeah, but it is a far transferred one. And, and so the concept's the same, but, but the uh, context is different. Right. Um, so, uh, there's, so there's some potential in this work. Uh, I, would, I should say we've done follow-up work. There's a lot of parameters. This doesn't work for everybody. Um, and we are trying to understand what is the right level of confusion to a certain learner, how long you keep them confused, until it becomes hopeless confusion. So we're, we're obviously uh, thinking about this theory, you know, we call it the zone of optimal confusion um, on, on, on how to adjust these parameters. Question. Sydney, um, back way back in EdPsych days, I learned a term cognitive dissonance. Is this in essence that, that phenomena? Yeah, this, this all feeds back, it, it's related. Um, it, 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 really, it really feeds back to, Piaget. if you want to take this back, it's Piaget and cognitive mm -hmm. disequilibrium okay. from, from that time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think you're arguing for a kind of a motivational, emotional based explanation here. Is that right? Is, are you able to discount you know, other sorts of more cognitive uh, explanations? For example, uh, you know, the people who say that they're confused uh, had, a, had a more active brain. Right, because they were they truly were puzzled, and so, you know, activation was running around, and so therefore they were able to get richer connections yeah. when they got the extra material. Yeah, um, uh, so I, I would I would I would say uh, I, maybe I'm uh, 
being too strong when using the term motivated to lead. I'm so they, they all. By the way, all of this is within subjects. Everything is within subjects. I, I would say that uh, what I mean is that there, there. It's not a conscious decision. Actually, you know, maybe I, we haven't studied the phenomenology of the leading part that much. Um, but I would say this though. Um, you you reflect it in the confusion is reflected in different ways. Sometimes we code for the face, different behavioral expressions, reading times. What I think is really happening, um, but to be verified is when they're, when, they're, when they're processing that text, they're just processing it at a deeper level than the typical shallow strategies. Okay. But it would be good to get some confirmation okay. on that okay. question. Okay. Um, from what you're studying, can you point out something uh, related to that question? Like, uh, do you think uh, people yeah. with different characteristics tend to show uh, kind of consistent emotions? If so, do you think is it kind of possible to classify people to according to their you know uh, regular emotions? I mean, you, could you say that okay, in at this position, this characteristic, this person can show this emotion, this kind of predictive uh, hypothesis? Yeah. So um, there's uh, the most of the cool work in emotions and education uh, is, is is the the work on um, that looks at um, more trait based work. And I'll point you to Reinhard Pecker and, and, and his, his big theory is the control value theory of emotion. Mm -hmm. um, so they do um, emotions across extended time scales and time stamps. Um, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, so, so, I, so, so that's some of the more trait-based stuff. Uh, we look at this in more of the terms of the state-based. Mm -hmm. They're totally connected. Um, so uh, I would say what has not been done, at least as what I have not done is, uh, or I, I'm not aware of, is, is good work. Um, trying to see uh, good trait-based moderators okay. of these state-based phenomena. Yeah, so, so, so to be TBD. Okay, cool. um, Okay, so I want to move on uh, to uh, affect detection. So how do we pick up uh, affect in real time and, and what can we do with that? Um, and I think this, this has applications. Um, so this is a field called affective computing that came about 20 years ago. Uh, it's, it's very uh, robust now, um, and uh, you know, it, it, um, there's, a, there's a flagship journal, I believe tra Transactions of Affective Computing, and I think it's cool that the journal that publishes about antennas and signals publishes about emotions. Um, so, um, One of the things that um, I love studying about affect, but it kind of drives me crazy, or everybody crazy, is, is the complexity of the levels of analysis. So here's kind of what's happening, and I think uh, this fits into this question. So. Um, Everybody's got their favorite model. Uh, this model makes everybody happy or irritates everybody. I'm okay with both. Um, so uh, there's some, I think we can agree that there's some person environment interaction um, that's driven by the context, social factors, et cetera. And there's some individual differences, culture, affective traits um, that sort of merge. And you have uh, changes occurring at many levels. Um, so there's neurobiological changes, there's physiological responses, there's bodily expressions, there's some action tendencies, fight or flight, and then you actually have this more appraisal, cognitive, metacognitive deal. Notice that there's no box here that says emotion or affect at all, because uh, affect is some emergent phenomena coming from this and moderated by this. So it's there somewhere, I don't know where, um, and, uh, and the idea is how do we, get, how do we elicit, how do we, how do we get out this elusive construct? Okay, so you can ask humans, and the, there are many ways, but typically you have self-reports or you have observer judgments. One thing we note is they have access to different types of information. So they have some information on the body, so they can see actions, some physiology, not a lot, but the humans are really good at inference, and they have emotions, and they have evolved, and they have experience, and then they are really sophisticated in that respect, right? So you can get some estimate from emotions. Um, but then we have the machine. It can sense some things that humans can't. You can have infrared cameras. You can have, you know, thermal cameras. So they can even get at the neurobiological levels. They can get at more of these lower levels, but they can't really get much. Um, so we try really hard, but our context-sensitive computing is they're not great, and so on and so forth. So what we do is we try to see if we can use machine learning to build models that take the best of the machine with supervision from what humans can provide. And that leads us to a model that can then produce affective estimates. And what we're trying to do here is model simultaneously both the low-level stuff with a signal coming from the top-level humans. And that's kind of um, the big goal there. Does that make sense? Question? Sure. Uh, do you want the mic? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you mentioned about the 
judgment and also machine sensing. Let's say we took a shoot a video while a person is experiencing something. Uh, as a person who doesn't have any experience in psychology, can I analyze the uh, you know the emotional changes that the participant has? I mean, how can I ensure the uh, validity or reliability of that analysis? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, if we, uh, so I'm going to get that at the next slide. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, okay sorry. Cool. So, so one thing to note is, um, if you look at, um, so the question is, where's the truth, right? Where's the truth? And the truth is in the eye of the beholder. And the truth is, what do you want to construct? If you want to believe that. But here's um, studies looking at. Uh, here's a list of studies looking at uh, learning sessions. Typically, learning. Um, how well can two humans with no training, two or more humans with no training, judge affective states um, at fine grain resolutions in a few seconds or tens of seconds? And, you know, these are kappas. Um, no self-respecting psychologist can ever deal with kappas like that. You typically want 0 0.6 to a minimum. But this is the reality of what you get. And you're really trying to, you know, find the eye in the hurricane, right, in these really narrow time steps. So humans by themselves, untrained humans, are not great. So, so, so they're, not, they're, not, they're not zero, but they're not great. The question is, how does this reflect what the self is feeling? What the person is feeling? And can you improve these results through basic things we learn in qualitative data analysis, coding? And so we did one study where we looked at a frame of judgment, uh, frame of reference training. So here's how it goes. Two people would come in, and they were actually people enrolled in a qualitative psychology methods class. So, so they weren't the typical. They would come in, they would watch a five-minute video, code emotion, right? Come together, discuss disagreements, go back and code another five minute video. Come together, discuss agreements, and do this over nine iterations. So theoretically, their agreement should improve. But we also had, at those same judgment points, what the self said, uh, what the person, what the learner themselves said about their emotions. So we can compare the two observers and the self and observers. Does that make sense? And here's what you find. Um, over time, the observers started really low in this data set, and they ended up pretty good, well, decent, 0.4. They doubled. So the two observer ratings kind of increased. But notice the, the correlation between the self and the observer. And it's essentially just flat. Um, and there was absolutely no improvement. And even here, it's kind of a nonlinear thing. Over, after three iterations, it basically plateaued. Um, so the, the general trend here is that um, this is a hard problem, and there's a lot of ambiguity for a genuine reason. And uh, our approach has been ambiguity is good, and we should try to model it and study it, um, you know, rather than come up with really controlled cases where we just, we just don't deal with it. So let's see how the machines do. Um, so we've looked at many things. And, and uh, some of this is just because it's fun. But honestly, others are because uh, it's, the, it's the, what the interaction allows. So if you're dealing with writing, for example, there's not much going on in the face. There's no, the face reacts to the world and interaction, really, right? So then we look at keystrokes or something like that. Um, but if you're having conversation, the face is good, and so on and so forth. So I'll tell you one of the first studies we ever did. This is in the context of Auditutor. So Auditutor is a conversational uh, intelligent tutoring system for physics and computer literacy. It's modeled after human tutors. It has conversation, it has dialogue. It's great. It's a little boring. It's a lot boring. Uh, but you really learn stuff deeply. Uh, so we said, OK. Um, a large part of what we see humans tutors do is respond to things like confusion and frustration and anxiety. Let's build those capabilities in auto tutor. So this is about, uh, so here's what we did. We had people have a session. This is the lab study with auto tutor. Here's auto tutor. We record their face and we record uh, another channel. These are both, these monitors are both off uh, during the time of the session. And this is 2004, as you can tell by the high tech uh, computers. <laughs> Um, so here's what we, we got. So we, we got some data from sensors. And I want to point out, we also have information. Uh, Auditude has very rich log files. This, it keeps a very sophisticated model of what you know. And a lot of emotion, these emotions we're talking about, confusion and frustration, they come out of states of knowledge, right? So, so you can get a lot of information from the context. Um, this, is, uh, this is another sensor we used. Um, so this is activity. Um, you can see the, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Uh, of the butt. Um, so this is actually a posture sensor um, that tracks uh, movement. And this is kind of important for things like boredom and engagement, where the movements are more subtle. Um, then we have, um, yeah, so then, then to, to, talk, uh, to, to speak to uh, this question, because of this ambiguity of where's the true emotional signal, we actually had people look at the videos. And we had four types of judges. We had the self reports after they finished the session. They review their own emotions every 20 seconds. 
we actually had each person review somebody else's emotion, the untrained peers, and we had two trained judges who've gone through extensive uh, facial action coding training for three months, and they also know a lot about auto theater. So in this case, we wanted to build models that combined these different perspectives. So here are some results. This is kappa. Uh, so zero is basically chance. Uh, novice judges, essentially, this is like uh, the self and the peer, they basically have their kappas are basically zero. Uh, training really improves it. Still, we can never cross that point four I talked about before. And actually, our computer coding um, is pretty decent uh, compared to the humans. I would say that uh, at the time this work was done, the comparison is not entirely fair because they weren't very careful about how we, who sees what data. So I'll give you updated results on this, but for the time, this was kind of promising. So we said, okay, let's do this. So we, here we are sensing confusion, frustration, and uh, boredom. Um, so let's put this information back into AutoTutor. So here's what we did. Um, what AutoTutor does is essentially it, um, it gives you a problem, then, it, then, it, then, it, then you give an answer, like a, like a difficult problem. How does the operating system interact with the word processing program when you create a document? Then it tries to eke information out of you. What it does is it hints, what about X? It prompts, it tries to pull information out, and in each of these dialogue moves, it gives you a question, it gets your response, and it interprets it, it gives you feedback, and then it moves on. We manipulated that feedback to give it a motivational tone that was sensitive to their emotional state. So for example, if they're frustrated, we change the attribution of frustration. You are not frustrated because you're stupid, you're frustrated because the stuff is really hard. Take it to the world. If you're confused, that doesn't mean you're not getting it. Confusion is a good emotion. So there were these um, touchy-feely, motivationally supportive moves, bl blending on sort of Dweck's work and mindset and attribution theory. And there was, a, there was a, good, a lot of good theory there. And we had expert tutors look at some of these data and suggest moves. So that's what the tutor did. And it also displayed empathy and did some other cool things. So we did an experiment. Um, here we have um, 84 people. Uh, they either interact with the auditor system as usual and the typical regular feedback without this motivational component. Everything else is the same. Um, and that kind of feedback is, good job, let's move on, what about this? Or they had the affective one. They had two 30-minute sessions uh, on operating systems, uh, computer hardware, and the internet. So they finished one session with, a, with an auditor. They started another session on a different topic with the same version. And then there was some transfer test um, later. Um, we divide people into low and high prior knowledge. So here are some results. And this is proportional learning gains, post minus pre divided by one minus pre. Um, <clears throat> so for the first session, low domain knowledge people, no difference in tutor version. Okay? For the high domain knowledge people, we actually take a hit. You learn better with a regular auto tutor. Do you know what this feels like after five years of work <laughs> um, of getting the detector right? Um, and, um, and actually, <laughs> the wrong way. Actually, and actually, what you're getting is, um, what you're really getting is, uh, we think a penalty. This motivational feedback can be annoying, it can be distracting, and it could even be a seductive detail. So uh, now, in the second session, the low domain knowledge people see a boost. This is significant, and, it, uh, and you get less of a reduction in the high domain knowledge people. And on the transfer test, you get a small boost um, for the low and, and the high. They already know the stuff, so they don't learn anything. These are effect sizes. Um, and our interpretation is this. Um, when you start out in the first 30 minutes, it's not that bad. Things are OK. You don't want to jump in and, and start with this touchy-feely motivational stuff. Let the problems really emerge. Let the true experience come out. And that happens around 30 minutes, um, if you've interacted with Auditor. Um, and um, this is when you really get the boost for low domain knowledge students. So there's this time for when to emote. Um, and, and also, this was our first attempt. It emoted too much. The design parameters weren't ideally optimized. Um, but um, this was, like I think, the first work at fully affect sensitivity. Um, uh, yeah, question? Can I, can, can I repeat back what you brought up? Sure. Uh, repeating back, is this what you said, that your explanation is that maybe the measurement of affect in session one wasn't there. People weren't affecting. There was nothing to measure, so there was nothing for the system to, 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 to react to. Is that what you um, said? I think that's, a, that's I, I think we'll say the combination. There's, there's stuff to measure, but, um, you know, it's a computer uh, 
program that's interpreting language, there's always stuff to measure because it, it can be frustrating. It just wasn't bad enough that, that we were intervening too soon and, and, and too much. So, so the, the, the intervention model was very primitive. It just said, if so, well, here's how it intervened. It looked at your past emotion, your current emotion, the confidence of your emotion, how well you've been doing on the topic overall, and how well you've done on the immediate response. So there was some sophistication there, but there was no sophistication of timing. If it just said, blah, 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 the next turn, it may say the same thing again. So that, that, I think that, that was too early to respond. That's one interpretation. So, so it might have been something like, so you're confused, don't give up. You know, and they're going like, I wasn't going to give up. Exactly, yeah, you know. exactly. But later in the lesson, you know, later on, they're going exactly. like, yeah, I was. I'm confused again. Exactly. I was going to give up. Exactly. That, sort of thing. that, was, that was something. That's, that's, yeah, question. Um, you said that uh, students with high n n domain knowledge uh, kind of didn't like the effective version of it. So can we claim that like more self-directed students don't prefer this different kind of methodologies, but they prefer direct? Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a great question. Uh, since this work has emerged, there's a general trend emerging here. So um, uh, work on people who do work on politeness feedback. How do you de design things to be polite? You get completely differential effects for lower versus high domain. Learning companions, there you get different effects. Um, we have another version. I won't talk about this today. It's a system that tracks eye gaze. Um, and when it notices you're like not paying attention, it says these really rude things like, hey, I'm over here. Actually, high domain knowledge <laughs> students, high domain knowledge students seem to benefit from that. So there is this one thing here about this central versus peripheral route. Um, and it's, it's too early to say, but I think you're honing in on something significant that is born out in other people's work. OK, so, um, so this was all done. This was 2010. Uh, it was done you know, in, in a more controlled environment. Um, so more recently, we've been doing this work uh, in classrooms, where there's much more noise. And, and, and as the sensing has advanced, this is work with Ryan Baker and, and Val Shute. Um, and um, this is also, uh, you know, after studying college kids for a long time, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of dull. I wanted to study some younger kids who, who you know, um, so, these are, high, these are high schooler, middle school kids um, playing this really cool physics game. So it's a fun experience. They love playing it. Um, so um, we uh, wanted to see if we can build a measure of affect in this case in classrooms. Uh, they're playing alone, but they all, you know, you can't control. They're talking and they're chewing gum and they're doing whatever they want. Um, so it's very noisy data uh, in classrooms in Florida. So these are about 30 kids at a time. And as they're playing this game over three days, um, uh, this handsome fellow is Ryan Baker uh, and his team. Uh, they go around, and this is an observer-based affect measurement. So they have this very cool protocol to do field observations uh, in groups. So you basically uh, use peripheral vision, and you look around, and you see if you can judge somebody's affective state based on their bodily behavior and also what's going on on the screen. Context is really important. And that's synced up with an app, and we then have very $25 webcams recording the, uh, recording the um, facial expressions. Okay. And um, here we look at a couple of signals. So here's um, uh, facial feature tracking. You can, uh, by the way, I can't show images of the actual students. So these are, these are other participants using the same software. This was a computer vision toolbox that then became a company. And now uh, Apple has taken it up. So it's, it's gone forever. Uh, but uh, it's pretty cool. And you can track uh, little facial expressions. You can see some mouth movements there. So you can see work. So you see activation around the lip and so on and so forth. So, so we're looking at facial expressions here. Also head movements. Um, and we uh, look at um, body movements. So this is something we've developed. It's, it's a very, very cheap way to get body movements. That sensor I showed before was $25,000. This is just with a camera signal. So you're basically trying to just uh, do what's called motion filtering and silhouetting. And you're basically seeing which pixels are changing, and you're building a model for each pixel. And you can get a decent time series. Sydney, uh, yeah. real quick, uh, online, Jerry is asking what the name of the company was from the last uh, time. It was, uh, it was, uh, it, they changed a lot, but it was uh, Emotion, uh, and the product was called Facet, and now it's, I don't think it's available anymore, but uh, if he wants to email me, I know some freer, cooler versions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is what's happening, and here are our results. By the way, now we're actually changing from Kappa to area under the curve, um, and the reason being, um, what you have with affective work is very skewed distributions. For example, delight is about 3% of the cases here, and 97% are uh, other. And then uh, kappa and all those metrics have real problems there. So here's uh, area under the curve. We're saying, OK, boredom versus all the other emotions. And guessing would give you 0.5. So as you notice, um, we're doing pretty decent. Um, 
you know, some of them are easier. Delight is very easy because there's very visual facial expressions. I want to point out that all of these models generalize across students. So whenever we build our models, there are certain students that are kept aside and they're not touched, and the models are built on one set, and they're, they're tested on this other set, and that's repeated. So that was kind of a cool question. Sydney, can I go back uh, just for a second on that, um, on the tools that you're using to take these measurements? Are they also then labeling um, those emotions? Um, I'm, I'm twisting my mouth or something, and it says, oh, boredom? Or... Yeah, no, so, so great, great question. Sorry, I should be more clear. So what happens here is every um, X seconds, and he's making a judgment or his, somebody in the team of boredom. There's two raters that boredom, confused, engaged, frustration, whatever. And that's time stamp. Then uh, we have these spaces being recorded. And we say, OK, um, at this time stamp, over this period of time, I notice activation in this math movement, that math movement, this movement. And then we use some machine learning mm. to build the model. Yeah, that, that's what's happening. OK, here. thank you. Um, you're, you're welcome. Um, and um, so, uh, so this is decent. Uh, now, when you go into this world, uh, as opposed to the lab, you notice something interesting. So um, we notice that um, the face is actually very accurate. This is the face, reasonably accurate. Everything here is um, reasonably terribly accurate. <laughs> it's reasonably accurate, above chance. But it's only available 65% of the time. We can only even detect the face. That's the first step. So two -third, a third of the time, a model is really useless. It can't pick out the face. Why? Because they're talking, they're turning, they're leaving, they're chewing gum, they're doing this, and stuff like that. Um, but we can actually have the log files of the game, and you can build an interaction-based model. Uh, I drew this object like 10 times, not getting it. I still, so you can build a model based on the log files. That's not that good compared to the face, but it's always, almost always there. So what we say then is this is straight up. The face is accurate, but it's not available. The, the, the other thing is available, but not accurate. So we build these multimodal models that sort of combine them and try to adjudicate. And what's cool here is we now have a model that works 98% of the time, yet it's almost as accurate as the face. Um, so, so it's something we feel that can actually really be used uh, in a very noisy environment. Um, and we took a step further, um, looking at different types of generalizability. So the data set here had like eight class periods. So you can imagine somebody's affect in the first day of class than in the last day of class, right? And not even that lighting conditions, because all of this computer vision is really affected by lighting. So um, you notice that actually it generalizes really well. So within means training and testing in the same thing, population, and across means training in one, testing in the other. So it works pretty well. You get a small hit, but it's not much across different class periods. We collected data over two days. Uh, we went to Florida for five-day data collection, but because of the threat of snow, school was closed for two days. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was like, can you imagine sending whole teams there? <laughs> and uh, this actually happened. But uh, there was a weekend. There was snow day still. So this is data collected on the first day and tested on the second day on new students. It works pretty well and vice versa. We looked at training on males, testing on females, training on females, testing on. So this is training on males, testing on males. It's almost as good or equally as good as training in males, testing in females. So it's, it's pretty good. And you're across ethnicity, uh, which is essentially the distribution was Caucasian or not. That's how it worked. Um, so, so we have some confidence, uh, at least limited confidence, in the generalizability of these models, at least within the context of the data set that we have. Um, so let me just quickly move on to talk about uh, some future projects. Um, so in terms of uh, generalizability, um, we want to look at much more modeling. So I was talking to some folks at breakfast. When you're actually having online learning, we want to get people to turn their computers on. This is data collected by a group at MIT where they had people watch commercials. Uh, look, you, this is what you have to really deal with. Um, these guys eating a chip and you, you know, the, the, the lighting and this profile view. and it, You don't really deal with stuff like this, correct? Um, typically, we've ignored it. But rather than ignoring it, the idea is we need to build this in the model up front uh, rather than worry about it later. Um, we've been working to get make a version of this game uh, affect sensitive. So um, it's fun, but the frustration can get too far because it's completely open ended. There's nothing. There's no hints. There's nothing. How do we actually build a model to tweak what's called good frustration? It makes the game enjoyable. With it's going too far, and we don't really know how to do that. And how do you do supports that don't ruin the experience of playing this fun game by just making it, you know, yeah. Um, and uh, as I was saying, uh, we have a MOOC on uh, helping people manage stats anxiety. It's really cool. And we put some emotion, uh, just very immediate self-reports in there over the whole MOOC period. Um, yeah, this is actually, this was our old provost. He's, he's very goofy. He made the MOOC. Um, but he's, he's really great. Um, and 
Uh, and then I'm more interested lately in doing work on emotion co-regulation. And we have like three or four people uh, interact, uh, solving some difficult problem, and understanding um, how cool would it be if I can predict like your facial expressions based on mine or something like that. So, so that stuff. Um, so I think that concludes the, the, the stuff on emotion. Um, and I know in terms of time, I can, we can stop and do questions so I can actually get into quickly the other part. Uh, what do you guys think? We should do some questions if that's okay, okay Kyle. Yeah. And um, just a reminder, if you have a question, please just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get it. Can I, can I start off? Because <laughs> this is, I think this is fascinating. So are you moving to the place where you'll use this combination of the data from what we often refer to as big data from the learning management system now that's collecting information on my performance in the system and perhaps an eye tracking device of some sort, right, combined with the modeling that you're creating that in the end then is adjusting the system for me? Is that, is that where we're headed? That, so the system says, oh, Larry, you're on the stats problem. You're, you're frustrated, but it's too early on to intervene. And a little bit later on, I'll intervene. So the system is not only adjusting the content based on my performance, but also on my affect. Is that kind yeah, of? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So one thing that you, hit, you, you mentioned is very significant is the combination of the information of what's occurring and what my face is doing. Because the body gives undifferentiated signals. So there's this illusion that the body is a way to go and physiology, your skin conductor and spikes for like everything, right? So it's very undifferentiated. So understanding the context is critical in being able to differentiate anger and fear, for example, and things like that, right? So that's one thing that's critical. Yeah, so your second point, um, I think the applications are many. Um, one is, you can even think about this as just, it's, it's really a direct measure to give a fine-grained temporal resolution. That's the key point. Like, fine-grained temporal resolutions, you can, there's a whole scientific question of how you study these processes, how you study co-affective states that come together, there's, there's no information on that. You can even use it to, to study materials. So my, uh, so Ryan Baker, they have a project where um, they have this math assessment tutor that like 50,000 kids in the Northeast use every day. They have their detectors that only deal with interaction patterns, see which problems kids in general find really boring. Mm -hmm. And then you can think about ways to redesign those. So there are many levels here. We can pick items for future study based on um, how their experiences are now. And finally, the other one is also direct uh, interaction, um, directly responding uh, based on the emotion, as you suggest. Yeah. We have a couple of other questions from outside. Uh, Michelle Wiley asks, I'm very interested in the MOOC on stats anxiety. Is there a timeline for completion? Yeah, um, so I can, uh, if you email me, I can send, there's like a preliminary paper talking about which affective states, and, and as, as I was mentioning, the interesting ones there are hope and uh, the, the ones we never see in our other contexts, hope and um, relief and pride. Those are, those are some of the big ones. Um, the timeline is, uh, this was the first study, there's only um, mouth reports, uh, so I can send it a paper, but um, uh, it's been done in two more MOOCs, and, and we're trying to send uh, Triangulate. Great. Carol H., who I believe is Carol Hodes, yes. asks, has the research included cultural differences? Um, so uh, thus far it has not. Uh, we are looking some now. Um, and you know, with, with this, with, so here's a couple of things. Uh, when you tell people online, in online studies, hey, turn your camera on, they actually turn it on. They don't care. So we could actually, um, I'm interested in collecting data uh, in, uh, you know, sitting in my living room. Having see how people respond across cultures to different affective stimuli, get data on uh, you know like for example Americans take another culture, um, uh, East East Asians or, or Asians. But here's the cool thing: you can actually get the facial expression of different cultures, and you can get how they perceive the event or the emotion, the label. You can then do very cool cross modeling. I take I'll take your facial expressions and my label, and and you can. It's crazy stuff or whatever, but we can do some really fun things cross-culturally. So we haven't done anything yet, uh, but I think we're looking to do stuff um, uh, it, it, with, with being able to do large-scale online data collection. Amy uh, Garbrick wants to know if you've done anything with push notifications I was or add smart on, push notifications. I was going to add on to that, too. Uh, she's interested in push notification and online learning, but it sounds like your auto-tutor is, in fact, pushing. It senses an emotion and then gives a response. Is that right? 
Yeah, it, 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 it's doing it as part of the dialogue, the dialogue cycle uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but I have not done any work myself uh, on push notifications. The people I'm working with, the MOOC people, they are planning on using the affective data to trigger some types of, some kinds of interventions or, or something um, to see to what extent affect can predict dropout. Or, so there's some, there's some work that, but I haven't done, uh, yeah. So also said, some uh, uh, talk about gender, looking at also at gender differences and those implications um, yeah, on the chat. Yeah, uh, so, so we haven't done too much uh, looking at gender differences um, because, uh, so, our, our studies are also, I would say, um, more more gender biased towards females because of where we collect the data. Um, so, so there didn't really is a good enough split to do meaningful tests. Uh, and second, uh, I don't like to do gender work unless I have a real theory as to why um, there should be differences. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious about how good this auto uh, tutor, like this artificial intelligence uh, interfaces, are good at uh, detecting emotions because I would be really, really interested in uh, seeing some kind of uh, like helper or assistant or agent in a game that you know yeah. acts based upon your emotions. Yeah, so let me speak to that. Um, they're they're good and they're getting better. They'll never be good enough. Um, and oh, I should point out one thing we did was we got actual teachers these videos I showed you to code these videos for emotions. I thought they'd be good. Everybody says you're studying these peers and experts. They were horrible. Uh, and in fact, uh, whenever the students said they were bored, the teacher said engaged. And it's almost you have to deal with some kind of dissonance to be able to survive. Uh, and I do this when I teach. Um, so the question is, I don't think we uh, need to wait. I personally don't want to wait for the day of perfect measurement. As long as what you do with the measures is responsible and deals with, so we like to think about this as soft, soft constraint satisfaction problems. So every intervention we always put together are always probabilistic. They are, we're really good at dealing with really, really noisy stuff. Um, so we also do work in speech recognition, and sometimes we missing out half the words, and we can deliver interactions that you can't even tell. So, so it's it's hiding the the ambiguity in the background. I would say just as humans do. Uh, can you really precisely tell in a conversation how somebody's attending to your emotions? Yeah, right? yeah. But I think we can we can say it seems like you're frustrated. Oh, so exactly, exactly. It's soft. And, and whether you use that word, depending on whether I I don't know how I would feel if a computer was saying, accusing me of being frustrated and stuff. And, and I should point out that um, in, depending on your culture, certain words, like um, there are a lot of cultural differences, like certain words, direct threats about intelligence, like, like things like confusion. And if you're praised, your whole life is you're so smart and things like that. It's, it's so, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, they might say, well, I am now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So I have two questions. Okay. And so the first one is, have you ever put like self-motivation as a factor into the consideration? And another one is, uh, have you considered doing study in terms of like to see how emotions will relate to learning outcomes? Yeah. Because there will be times like the kids will be very confused, but in the end, and um, he motivated himself the entire time. And also, there would be the kind of very engaging, but the learning outcome is on the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So let me just uh, answer your second question first, because I forgot the first one. Uh, I'll ask you about it again. Uh, so the correlation with emotions and learning is a tricky issue. Uh, so if you think about there's nothing magical about some emotion that needs to have some causal influence on learning. What do emotions do? They bring information. They say what's important. It's a value system. They help you with appraisals. They tell you how they, it's, a motiv it's a motivational system, and it helps you deal with fast action. It motivates cognitive systems. So emotions are, should always be having effects mediated through cognitive processes. So the experiments, we do a lot of these, and there's a lot that's done, but they're more basic experimental work. So for example, uh, let me induce an emotion. Let me actually have you read something. Let me look at your eye tracking, and let me see how you do on outcomes. Let me induce some emotions. So there's a lot of uh, literature showing the causal pathways and modeled well. In this work, we, these are more correlational, so you have, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, it's clear, pretty clear, what we find is this. Um, confusion falls on both sides. Uh, in some studies, it's actually been positively correlated. In others, it's negatively correlated. It depends on the type of confusion and what you're doing with it. 
If I'm confused about the fundamentals of even being able to have an interaction, that is not even at this deep level we're talking about. If, if I, you know, if I start speaking German now, and you don't speak German and you're confused, you're not going to learn my, my talk better, right? So that's the other thing. You can be confused and you don't have any supports. Uh, there's no learning supports. And it's like you're banging your head on the wall. That's not going to help you, right? So it's this, what are the contexts in which confusion can be beneficial? And there are many when it's not. Um, the same thing with boredom. So oh, pretty clearly boredom seems to be negatively correlated. Uh, others are more tricky. Frustration. You may expect negative correlations, but it's not. The fact that you're even frustrated means you're even willing to engage in this thing and not just give up. Um, so uh, so it, it, it's, 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 I wish there was, it was more simple than this, and, and, uh, but I will tell you, um, uh, Reinhard Peckran, who's one of the leaders in emotions education, his grad student is doing a meta-analysis now on the, the links between emotions and learning outcomes. Uh, she had a preliminary work paper at AERA this year. Kristen, I could give you the information, yeah. And the first question is related to like, self-motivation. As yeah. Into this. Um, so, uh, admittedly, uh, in all of these experiments, we always give a bunch of individual difference measures. Um, we never have enough sample sizes in some of these to do good moderation analyses. So, uh, I will say in a lot of these, they do complete the achievement motivational questionnaire. Um, I would point to you to, to other literature that bridges uh, motivation theory with affective theory. And, and it's, it's out there, and, um, and if you talk, I can send you the references. Our work typically doesn't have a large enough samples to look at more than one covariate. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a very good point, and that's the other reason I want to um, look at these, mm -hmm. getting interested in looking at these larger, excuse right. me, samples, is to yeah. be able to, to, to ask questions like that. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Thanks. So as, as I'm kind of chewing through what you're saying, um, seeing correlations with flow theory and how this is actually kind of taking flow theory and, and putting it down to actually stimuli level. Is that a fair assessment? And are you looking at how that whole challenge ability uh, can be influenced by specific interactions? Yeah, so there's a, so good, there's a great question. So here's uh, the thing with, so uh, the initial work was highly influenced by flow theory. Uh, the issue was that, maybe it's not an issue, when we got down to it and you look at the data, I don't see a lot, I have, I have not seen a lot of evidence of flow in non-intrinsically motivating tasks. So in extrinsically motivating tasks, Man, uh, you know, they don't, there's, little, there's very little flow, and in fact, uh, we have a joke. We, our first, we used to call engagement flow, and then it, now it's called the affective state, formerly known as flow, because we've never been able to define it. Engagement, engage concentration, it's gone through every single thing. And I, but, but, and, and, but, but the other point you raise, which is a, is a great point, is the um, challenge difficulty, the difficulty challenge gap. And I'm fascinated by that, because... Um, in the cognitive literature, there's a lot of really great work, and in the psychomotor, the motor literature on optimal curves of difficulty and so on and so forth. And then there's the other side of it. It's the optimal level of difficulty, and what's the optimal level of the optimal level of difficulty for learning versus the optimal level of difficulty for motivation. Yeah. And there are these different curves. Um, so, so the so sorry to ramble, but um, I would say I I was I'm still influenced by flow theory. A lot of these systems are based on aspects of flow. This is why I'm interested in getting back into the games because we can study the affective variables with flow in the gaming context, and there is real flow there, you know. Um, so, so ex you are exactly, exactly, and you and there's mo it's, it's fun and it's motivating, and it's got these elements. Um, so, so right now, I'm hoping that maybe by engaging more with games, we can get back to understanding some of these variables of flow too. Yeah. So at this point, we've uh, we've exhausted the time that we allocated for this first session. I'd like to thank Dr. DeMello for his, uh, his willingness to share with us today and what, what, I, what I believe was a very interesting and compelling conversation.